Hey, small business people and lovers of good stories in general. Welcome to episode 31 of Small Business War Stories. And this one is awesome. They're all awesome, but this one's particularly awesome because I love the guy. This guy's uh, Guy Mulvesi. His name is Guy. He is in Clarksdale, Mississippi, and he is a proprietor of a place called the, the Shack Up Inn. And the shack up in is basically these uh, old Mississippi shacks that got turned into a bed and beer, they call it, not bed and breakfast. They, they do have breakfast, they have bagels and coffee, but they do have a lot more beer than that. So it's a great place. I go there every year to write uh, songs and to uh, play the blues, um, really get the feel for the Mississippi Delta. It's a place with a lot of history. Uh, a lot of it painful. Not all of it. Uh, not all of it is great. And uh, but there's definitely a lot of soul seeping from every word and every uh, you know piece of wood there, and every word that guy shared with me during the podcast. So it was uh, yeah. I'm really excited for for this one to to be published again. This one was uh, taped in Clarksdale, Mississippi during the Soul of America tour, and as a part of the Soul of America tour, it is brought to you by Impact Crates. Impact Crates is a company that makes collapsible dog crates that are the ideal solution for dog owners. Uh, when Muddy Waggers, my dog, and I were in the Mississippi Delta, he was in his Impact Crate. He loved it. It was very easy to carry. It was very easy to, well, he didn't carry it. I carried it. But it was very easy to fold up and carry the crate. If you go to Impact Crates and use code MUDDY20, M-U-D-D-Y-2-0, you can get 20% off your own Impact Crate. The episode is also brought to you by Badger Mapping. When I was going through Mississippi, I used Badger Mapping as the way to get around, to plot how the best route is to go from place to place. It's a great app for field salespeople. If you let them know that you found them on Small Business War Stories, they will give you two free months. And the Soul of America Tour is also brought to you by Tecova's Boots. If you're tired of paying $700 for handcrafted boots, Tecovas is where you need to go because they go direct to you without using dealers. So it's T-E-C-O-V-A-S. Great looking boots. I use them every single day. I wore them every single day all over the country for the tour. And I'm going to be wearing them for the next one, for the Soul of America 2 tour, which is coming up through the Rocky Mountains. But I'll share more about that as that date gets closer. The Every episode of this podcast the Small Business War Stories podcast is brought to you by Proven. And Proven.com, P-R-O-V-E-N, is a company I started with my business partner, Sean. And we are a leading small business hiring tool. Uh, you don't have to go around posting to every job board. We make it easy for you. We have partnerships with all the major job boards you could think of out there. Uh, and there is a very easy-to-use system that's specifically created for small businesses. And thousands of small businesses use Proven, and you can join them with a free trial at Proven, P-R-O-V-E-N dot com. Without further ado, I want to get into the episode with Guy Malvizi at the Shack Up Inn in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Small Business War Stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. And we are live here in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And I, I guys already making hand gestures here, but I have, I have the pleasure of sitting down with my friend Guy Malvesi of the Shack Up Inn. Welcome to the show, Guy. Hey, man. Good to be here. Yeah, it's good to see you again. So I met you about two years ago, the first time I came here uh, to play the blues, and I've been coming back every year ever since. Yeah, man. We can't get rid of you. <laughs> a lot of people try, man. It's hard. It's hard. Uh, so this, you got a really unique place here with uh, where you're in, right in the outskirts of Clarksdale, Mississippi, and you have uh, a bunch of uh, sharecropper shacks that had like really embody the spirit of the blues. Um, and, and you have people from all over the world that come and stay here. Tell me a little bit more. How did this get started? Like, what was the original idea of uh, why, why do this? Well, what we were doing each afternoon, we were coming out here and staying in my partner's Bill's 
house over here to, yeah where you've stayed or yep. you i've jammed there before jammed sure, over yeah. there before and we would we were just sitting around every day having a beer or whatever yeah and uh these europeans and asians would come through yeah just looking around because this plantation was significant in the fact that it is where the cotton picker was invented in hobson plantation hobson plantation it took international harvester 17 years before it went into production okay and when it did mr hobson bought 13 of the first 16 off the assembly line okay wow which that in itself started the second wave of migration to the cities people were out of work okay cotton picker could pick as much cotton as probably four or five six eight hundred people wow that's amazing and pine top perkins too who was a keyboard uh, the keys player for uh for muddy waters for mm -hmm. a long time he's from here from hobson right he is from a little town south of here called itabina okay and actually that story is uh, he got picked up uh by a bus in itabina uh -huh. in the late 30s early for early early 40s yeah and he was asked or told could anybody drive a cotton picker and he got off the bus here and they had told him he was going to work for his uncle sam well he didn't realize that he thought he had an uncle sam somewhere where uncle sam was the government he was oh, getting picked shit. up to be taken to the war to you know to 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 be part of the war probably his labor yeah um so luckily he uh, he said i can drive a cotton picker and that's how he got out of going to world war ii got it and I, actually in 2000 we found out uh, ike turner was on the grounds here and he wanted to see pine top and i walked ike over to see pine top yeah and we found out in a conversation between the two of them that Pine Top taught Ike how to play piano about a half a mile from here over on the Sunflower River in wow. a shack. So nobody really knew that until they wild, hooked up and started bullshitting. That's good, man. Yeah, that's a lot of what I'm trying to do with this uh, the Soul of America tour is like have people tell their stories, you know, and then right. just kind of record that, and it's cool yeah so anyway these asians back to how we yeah. started these asians and, and and europeans were stopping by just looking at plantation and at the time uh one shack had been moved onto the grounds that was kind of like a little singer songwriter shack okay these people started asking could they let it could they rent it so you basically had the one big house and just one shack and people wanted to stay there yeah cool which which shack was it Cadillac Shack. Oh, the one in the corner. Yeah. Uh huh. I'm staying right next to that crossroads. Right? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one shack led to two shacks, yeah. and two shacks led to four shacks, and. How long ago did the first shack had rented out? 1998 is when we started. Okay, so almost 20 years now. Yeah, 19 years this year. Wow, that's wild. It's and then how how did the progression of so right now you have about a dozen shacks here, right? Well, we've got 19 shacks. Oh wow! Okay. Over here, or maybe close to 19. Okay. And uh, then we've got the 10 rooms in the cotton gin. We've got 29 units over on this side of the track. Okay. And how how was that progression? Did you add them all at one time? Or no, was it like man. Every year? We didn't have any money. We just slowly, you know, we would add a shack or two when we got the money. Yeah. And back in those days. Shit, it just had to sit around till we scraped up enough money to to renovate it. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about that. How do you find a sharecropper shack to and how do you bring it here and how do you renovate it so that people want to stay in it? Well, you basically shacks. Well, I'm, I'm almost 62 years old. When I was a kid, I would pass. We're an hour hour from Memphis. I, we would go by. 10,000 shacks yeah. in between here and, and Memphis. But through the years, with the farm equipment getting larger in size, people 
farmers not needing near the labor that they used to, yeah. to have, then they started disappearing. Okay. So people started calling us. So we would find a shack that was, a, you know, vacant and get in touch with the farmer. But most of them were people that would call us and say, hey, you want this shack? Or, Shit. You know? so, okay, so let's say, I mean, these shacks all look, I mean, they have a similar aesthetic and size, but they're all pretty damn different. Why, how, do you, how do you even pick one of these up and move it? Do you have to disassemble it or do you just pick it up? No, you just hire a moving company. Okay. That um, they'll, they'll go in and they'll jack it up where they can get a trailer up oh, under wow. it. And then they'll let it down on that trailer. Wow. And they'll, then they'll bring it in here. That doesn't sound cheap. How much does it cost to move a shot? Well, the last one that we moved by a moving company was that shack down there, the Claremont oh, shack. That's where I stayed uh, last September. That's where we put the degeneracy yeah, in. That that's yeah, a, that's a big one. <laughs> that, that holds a lot of degeneracy. <laughs> uh, it came from Claremont, Mississippi, which is six miles down the road. That ain't bad. And, uh, well... We paid five grand to move it here, okay. which is a lot of money for us because my partner, Bill, who yeah. you know, yeah. was driving past it one day, and they had a backhoe out there and were, were tearing the front porch off of it. And Bill stopped and said, you know, what are y'all doing with it? And they said, oh, we're tearing this thing down. He said, yeah. well, hold on. So he came and got me, and we ran down there and went inside, and basically you just jump around the shack if you don't fall through, then that means the floor's good. <laughs> and then we got a moving company to move it here. So that's that sounds like a highly scientific we, process of, uh, <laughs> of checking it out. Yeah, lots of weed and alcohol involved in uh, <laughs> the building process of this place. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I, w I wouldn't expect <laughs> anything less from you guys. <laughs> but the last couple of small shacks that yeah. we moved here. Okay. We just because it was so expensive to move that one, I got in touch with this guy that has a wrecker truck where the back will kind of slide, it'll tilt up and go slide down where they can get cars on it. Oh, got it. Yep. He can move a small shack with it, and the last two that we moved here was like six, eight hundred dollars. I oh, mean, really cheap, you know, so a lot better than five grand. Beats the hell out of five grand. So you added the big, uh, you know, kind of two-story, um, you, you know, uh, what, what do you call them over here, the bins? Right? The rooms and yeah. the cotton gin, yeah. yeah. We, those are new. And Newly. then, so does that mean that from now on you're not going to add any more shucks? You're just going to add, or are you still thinking about adding more shucks? No, you know, like I said, I'm almost 62. Bill, he's about 65 or 66. It's yeah. like we're getting close to that. It's over stage, you know. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, what, how do you, what, what's forward? Come on, don't tell me it's over. Don't break my heart like that. Well, all the building. We can sleep over 100 people on the grounds now. Right. So, I mean, how big do you want to get? It's no, like, it's amazing. Just, but you're going to keep doing it, just not adding more to it. Right. It's That's, just, yeah. I'm uh, glad we clarified that. Yeah. You know, I don't want to have to start breaking unless, down. Unless somebody's listening to this, you know, little radio segment that just has a buttload of money they want to come yeah. buy a real cool operation then we're we'll be open to holy shit. discussions i was unaware that the shack up in was for sale and i don't know any fucking things for sale at the right price dude there you, you go. ought to know that <laughs> you know life lessons from guy Malvisi in mississippi well you know it's a hell i tell you what it's a recession proof operation because in 2008 when the yeah. bottom fell out our business went through the roof and even with this last presidential election kind of freaking out over the our international business and you know i've got a pretty good barometer as far as in the future what's coming my reservations tells me that the europeans and the scandinavians and the australians they're just saying Has, it's had an impact screw trump we're coming to the mississippi to the south yeah no it hadn't phased oh it hadn't phased it okay mm -mm. got it okay well that's good that's good for you oh yeah that's awesome that's awesome so let's talk a little bit more about setting up the shacks and then i'd love to talk a little more about clarksdale and like the you know music tourism in general but so once you get a shack here you know you've already jumped on it 
uh, and then, you know, to make sure that nobody falls to the floor. Yeah. You, then you patch up the floor you have, uh, and the ones that I've stayed, at least, there's some patching with uh, license, license plates. License plates, yeah. yeah, man. There you go. And then how do you balance, uh, so you have in your website, this kind of like, uh, you know, very defined tone of like, if you don't like it, the Ritz we ain't, you know, like don't, don't hit the road. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But they are, they are nice. And I've stayed with them for entire weeks and they're air conditioned and they're, you know, how do you kind of balance out, like keeping the authenticity and the awesomeness of the shack where you can like go in there and, and stay and feel like you have an authentic experience with the blues in Mississippi and also, uh, you know, making it nice enough for people to stay. Right. Well, yeah, you don't see sheetrock and you don't, you know, I mean, it's not, we try to leave it as natural as possible, okay. you know, uh, with the exception of, you know, we need running water in there. You need, you don't want an outhouse where people have to go outside to use yeah. the restrooms. We put restrooms and showers and that sort of stuff. So, yeah. you know, just your basic amenities, um, AC, heat, running water, sh shower, yeah. microwave, coffee maker, condiments, that sort yeah, of stuff. I don't stuff. have a microwave in my house. You, you're doing better than I am. Well, you know, <laughs> you need to start buying a few shacks and renting them out, and maybe you could afford it. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Huh. So let's talk about the blues, man. You, you were born here in Mississippi, right? Mm -hmm. So you're from here. Uh, you've seen probably like a, the a lot of different stuff happened with the blues from all the way from you know it used to be that nobody knew who Marty waters was and then the stones kind of said like came here and like well, how the fuck do you guys not know who Marty waters is we named our band after Marty waters right uh, Marty waters song and then there's been a renewed interest in the blues and there's been kind of oscillations over the years uh how do you see the interest in the region and like how do you see like the history of people coming here to seek the roots of the blues well i mean the blues ever since you know and i and i found out about the blues once i was i'm a big album collector I always bought lps yeah even when eight tracks and cassettes came out and i still bought see and i kept my albums through the years but in the late 60s early 70s started putting credits on the backs of albums or on the on the labels yeah. of the song. So all of a sudden you start to see these names popping up, you know, Fred, Mississippi, Fred, Fred McDowell, Fred McDowell yeah. on there, or, you know, so it just started, and, and I was big into like the Stones, all kids my age, you know, the Rolling Stones yeah. and, and the Beatles, but love early Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, they, love, they have that one first album that's basically full blues. Yeah, Before first Steve first Hicks. two or three are, yeah, are they're just, amazing. just yeah. great. Uh, of course, it got more into blues rock, and I still loved them then. But start these names started popping up, you know, and then yeah. names of people from this area, you know, where the Stones, we'd have, they'd have some Muddy Water stuff on on their albums. Right. And, and Fleetwood Mac, you know, had Fred McDowell yeah. or, or just whoever. You know? I was just in Muscle Shoals in uh, in the room where the Stones recorded "You Got to Move," oh, which yeah. is a cover of a Lightning song. Right? Oh yeah, Lightning Light Hopkins. No, uh, that's a, a, a well. It's probably go predates Fred McDowell, but oh, okay. uh, no, he. Oh, was it Fred McDowell? I think it was Lightning? Fred Mississippi oh, okay. Fred. So maybe, I believe. Yeah, sorry, I mean, I mean, mm -hmm. my bad. But uh, in any case, that's also them paying tribute to oh, sure. their original uh, roots. Right? Absolutely, that's absolutely. Awesome. So how have you seen like the, like maybe like walk me through the last twenty years? Do you see more people coming to Clarksdale seeking the roots of the blues? Do you see fewer people? Well, of course we see way more now because we've got something that draws them here. Whereas before, back in the mid nineties, yeah. a friend of mine, I had a you know where Hambone is oh, yeah. down in Clarksdale. I played, I played there before. Well, I used to own those two buildings there, Hambone oh, sure. and the and the rock and blues museum right oh, there. Oh, yeah, yeah. But my office was That's up. That's uh, with Theo, right? The yeah. Theo. Yeah. Theo. Yeah. yeah. But my office was upstairs okay. in Hambone where the glass is, yep. and I could look down. And these people, we called them flip-floppers or tattooed, or, you know, people, lots of Europeans, lots of New York, L.A. people doing cross-country trips, but yeah. they just didn't look like the local Delta people. They would come in and look around and uh, turn around and leave. And I'm sitting up there one day with a friend of mine, and, and I just said, shit, man, we need something to sell these guys. Yeah. 
you know? And uh, he said, yeah, he said, you know, let's go meet with uh, local tourism and the county administrator and, yeah. and talk to these guys. So we, uh, yeah, just get the girl at the uh, desk if you need a beer or something. She'll be glad to help you. Sorry about that, folks. Yeah, no problem. Business. You got you to gotta run, run the place while being on the interview, so. <laughs> um, where was I? So, so we take these, you know, the suits out. Yeah. You know, Take them to a restaurant, feeding them. We're trying to talk about, hey, how you doing? We're trying to talk about this blues market that's out here that's coming to Clarksdale. We're not promoting it. We don't even know shit from Shinola about it, yeah. you know? We don't know what to do, except they're here looking around. And they're hungry and would, for the blues. And would buy something if we had something for them. Yeah. So we're, we're sitting at, at a restaurant there. We've. We fed them, you know, we're picking up the tab, talking to them about what we think needs to happen. And one of the guys looks down at his watch and he says, oh, wow, it's a quarter till eight. We've got to go home and watch Dallas or one of these <laughs> soap opera, nightly soap yeah. opera shows that was running back in the 90s. And, and he looked at the other person and said, yeah, and they start moving their chairs out. And it's like, I said, we're not finished. And he said, oh, yeah, but we've got to go watch, you know. And I looked at my friend, and I said, I said, this fucking meeting is over. I said, the bottom line is if we want to do something, we're going to have to do it. We're yeah. going to have zero help from local or state on this deal. They don't see the big picture. And that's basically what we did. Yeah. You know, we just did it ourselves. And. Um, have you seen the attitude of the, you know, uh, say local or state authorities change toward the Delta since music yeah. tourism has become more prevalent? Yeah, they, you know, you got some people that are never going to get it. Yeah. That they don't like the blues. I know it's, it might be a black thing, might be the music they don't like. It's the whole devil, you know. Well, fuck them. <laughs> yeah, well, fuck them. It's, that's the attitude we took, yeah. you know. It's a lot easier to go over and talk to somebody who understands what you're talking about rather than trying to change somebody's mind. You're sense. just wasting your time and their time. And it's that a conversation sense. that it's, it's just going to get you into an argument with them. Or that's probably it's good, wasted time. It's probably a good life lesson in general, it's, right? Like find, pretty, find your audience and the people who yeah, love yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can't change the world yeah. with what, you know. So, yeah, they've changed. I mean, it's, you know, we used to walk into restaurants years ago and they, people would say, you still got all those weird, you know, flip-flopper, ponytail people staying with you? But then all of a sudden all these weird flip-flopper, ponytail people started spending some money eating with them. Yeah. And they realized that these people are not a threat to anybody. Right. They're just here. To give us money, yeah, and to kind have of a good up, time, drink up the soul of the, of the and head back home yeah. and tell people about it, and that's you know that's our clientele. Yeah, so most of your, um, I mean, I found out about this because of the uh, blues guitar workshop, but I presume most of your ad uh, advertising or most of your customers come from word of mouth. Do you do any advertising well, at all? Well, very little. We will advertise when we need to spend money. Okay. You know, um, we're starting to advertise now, oh, you are? but only in target markets. Like Li Living Blues is going to do a Clarksdale issue here in June, July. Okay. So we bought a three-month campaign there. On the magazine or the website? On the magazine. On the magazine, okay. Yeah, they threw in the website yeah. for free, okay. you know, because we're spending some pretty good money with them. So. Cool. But... Uh, so we do, do and, we, and then there's some blues festivals that will help out that, you know, will need some money. You can't help them all. I mean, once you right. open that floodgate, they wear your but ass out. But you're sponsoring, so it's a little bit different, though. You're sponsoring these local events that are along with the vibe of what you're doing. That's different than, like, say, buying, like, well, I guess buying magazine space is, is advertising, but we're buying Google. You're not buying Google ads, though. Like no. A lot of people just find you because they, they, they hear about you. We're real cautious about where we put any, I mean, I, you know, we don't want our ads in a upper end snooty ass magazine that yeah. 
Uh, you know, there's just some people that wouldn't like it here, and we what don't want them here. American, would that be somewhere you would advertise or not? We are thinking about it, but that's more Delta people that lived here okay. that moved off. Okay. So that's not actually our target market there. Got it. We're okay. living blues is more so of a target market. Or King Biscuit Flower Hour over in Helena, Arkansas, Sunny Pain. Okay, I don't know. You know, know that's I'm the not- longest... Uh, 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 radio blues show in the world. Okay. You know. So you advertise with them. It, they have a big European market. Okay. Yeah. So you got it. What's the percentage of people that are up from abroad here versus America? About forty percent. Forty percent. Forty percent international. Okay. About forty percent come from outside of a four hundred mile radius. Yeah. Still within the U.S. and Canada. Yeah. And then twenty. And the last twenty percent are local regional from they, basically mississippi Tennessee, Memphis, or jackson st louis or you know yeah cool man yeah i've been to all those places in this trip yeah <laughs> yeah now memphis but let's talk a little bit about the superstitions associated with this place so this place has a magical feeling you sit here and like we're about to hit the golden hour here where the light's going to start hitting every piece of rust perfectly and like that yellow truck which you painted from, from the first time i came that's here. a new truck we bought oh, last year Got what happened to the old one? It's getting redone. Yeah, oh, okay, cool. So we have yeah. two trucks. Yeah. That's sexy. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the superstitions and stories associated here with uh, the Shack Up Inn and Hobson Plantation? You mean of people that have been here? Yeah, and like all kinds of, you know. Well, now, just like, you know, we have people that will see visions, of, like, in their room at really? 3 in the morning. Tell me more know, about that. What do they see? Or this door closed and and nobody was there that kind of stuff and uh-huh. I, and always you can come sit down here Effie I'm just I'm just letting you know whenever you're ready I'm ready in a minute <laughs> like is they're telling us you know well this I put this here when I went to sleep and I heard what sounded like footsteps and it was over in the other room the next morning so my question to all of them which I always just shoots this sherry to shit you know to hell and back like were there any alcohol was it any alcohol and or drugs legal or le- or illegal yeah. involved yeah and they always say pretty much yes <laughs> I, I don't pin them down as to which of those three got it things got it. So, it too much beer quote unquote yeah let's <laughs> just say that you know so. Yeah. So, so the combination of uh, of substances with uh, people wanting to see those things probably helps. Yeah, yeah. You bit. got some people that you know they cool. they want to walk away from here and say, "Hey, place is haunted." Hey, in well, a cool it, way. It does have a cool no, vibe. no yeah. threatening yeah. ghost. I mean, has, I wrote. You know, I, got, I was telling you, I wrote one of my better songs here, sitting on one of those porches. So, yeah. I'm still waiting on that mailbox money to come in for writer's credit on that there song. There you go. <laughs> well, uh, you were for. <laughs> Unfortunately for you, I'm not sure that I am uh, compelling enough as an artist to uh, generate any profits. Yeah, so. whatever, you know. <laughs> awesome. Uh, what about, like, people that have come through? So you have an amazing, not only is a shack up in, you have the place where people stay, but you have also the Juke Joint Chapel, which is an amazing uh, live music venue. Actually, we had Mark Byer from Victoria Amps on the on the show, and he, uh, you know, has his amps here. Right, I house, bought some amps. Yeah, the yeah. house amps. And uh, so, tell me more about the Juke Joint Chapel. Like, well, who, like, who are some of the folks that have come through here and played? I know I saw Super Chicken when I was here, and I've seen like you know, lots of different oh, people. Oh yeah, you know, like you know, and it, you just never know from day to day who's yeah. gonna pop in here. So I mean, we've just had, you know, no huge names. Yeah, we don't really well, want. Well, Charlie Musselwhite recorded live. Yeah, at yeah, Chapel. yeah. I mean, we, he's a we, blues legend. Yeah, yeah, we got a Grammy-nominated album oh, that that's we it. cut up in no here. Big deal, right? You know, you know. And it was kind of weird because Robert Plant made a comment to my partner Bill. Bill told him, "said Guys, guy wants to make a live recording room out of this," and and Robert said, mm, "That no way that's gonna happen in this room." Blah blah blah. But you know, I I got a sound engineer. Yeah. I got an acoustic professor from the University of Mississippi, sure. old hippie boy, yeah. came over here, and he mic'd it up and pinged the room while I was building it. 
That's awesome. And I explained to him, I said, we don't have the money for sound panels and all that stuff, and I don't want a sterile sound anyway. So he said, look, man, put this, put Cypress up as high as you can here and ended up with the fantastic sounding. Sounds incredible. Oh, it's killer, man. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I've got people that show up here and just can't believe the sound that's yeah, coming. Yeah, we record here for the guitar workshop, and those recordings Sounds sound good, incredible. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And you also, so how do you deal, because there's a lot of different metal signs, so there's like the old gas station signs, the old Coke signs, and like the, um, you know, a lot of like, you know, different uh, well, memorabilia things on the wall. Well, right? the tent, yeah, the tent is corrugated, so the, le the less flat, hard, flat surfaces you have, yeah. better. the better you have, the okay. better it is. And then I sprayed that ceiling. Shit. That's that really dampened the sound down. So, okay. so actually, when the sound goes out, yeah, it never bounces straight back to you. That's where you run into your problem. It gets kicked over to the next wall, which kicks it over, and it's just and a you, that, total. That works. It works. Everywhere. So anybody, so if people are interested in coming to the Mississippi Delta and recording, uh, how how would they go about doing that? Do they just contact you and you can set it up uh, with them? Yeah, they just give us a call. I mean, you know, it's we probably record one person out of fifty. Wow. Well, Shit, I, feel, I feel too lucky now. I mean, I've recorded twice here. <laughs> well, you recorded it with the uh, during the guitar workshop, right. but I mean, these are people that want to come in and cut an album here but okay we just don't want any we're not in that in it for the money we don't want to just say oh well that was recorded at the shack up in we want to make sure it's cool yeah and there's a lot of uncool bands out there <laughs> well you know what i'm talking about yeah we want the right sound the right band i mean if it's a band that doesn't have their shit together i don't care what kind of recording engineer and or equipment or room you've got they yeah. don't sound, sound like shit that's true you don't want stuff that's nah, being recorded nah. here to sound like uh -uh. shit I, mm -mm. I can understand that mm -mm. In, in, all, in all your years doing this i mean this is a, a, a awesome awesome success and like the feel of this place is, is magical uh what would you say is the, your number one business lesson or piece of advice you would have for people trying to either thinking about starting a small business or people who are currently operating small businesses all across america well, just like us, when we started this thing, we were renting the property. Yeah. And I had a, a bunch of retail stores in the state of Mississippi. And one thing that I knew, when our business got good, the landlord was going to go up on our rent. Yeah. And at the time, the landlord was one of our partners. Okay. So I kind of went to the two other guys. We had five of us involved. I went to the two guys that I knew would agree with me and I said we need to buy this property yeah they were like well we'll never pay it off and I said well we'll never make any money unless we get it by this property because all of yeah. our money is going to go to paying rent on the place so what what I'm telling people out there is we had zero support from the town none of the b local bikes would touch us and we were just, I was persistent. Every time I'd see the bankers downtown, you know, after the first initial presentation I did right. at the local banks, when they said, we can't help you, I'd just say, hey, man, you you better get on board, you know. We ain't going to need you. Yeah, the shack up and train is leaving the station Yeah, without your ass. And pretty much, you know, after about a year's time, and every now and then I'd see one of the local bankers, and I'd fuck with them, basically. Yeah, you know, better get on board, dude. Well, anyway, one of the bankers calls me out of the blue, and he said, "He said, guy, he said, you know, we had a board meeting this morning. We want, we're gonna loan you that money." And I mean, we we were looking at probably three hundred fifty thousand dollars to buy the property. Yeah. I wanted to build the rooms over in the yeah, sure cotton thing. gin. I wanted this room, you know. So it's a substantial for us. It was. Yeah, no, it's a big deal, man. So uh, when, uh, when did you build the main Duke Joint Chapel? It was after you had the shacks, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. That was about 09, 010. Okay. Oh, okay, sure. Oh, oh, oh 09, I'm going to say. Okay. But what I'm telling people is had no local support in town. And uh, after the first banker called me, 10 minutes later, the second local banker called me. 
the word had already gotten out. Yeah. He's, and he told me, he said, he said, man, I think I'm missing the boat, like you just said. And I said, well, you are missing the boat, Willis. And he said, can I have some of their note? And I said, look, you work it out with them. I don't give a damn. As long as your interest rates are in line with theirs, you can have it, you know. Wow, and, all of a sudden and, it became competitive. Yeah, yeah. And so anyway, you know, so if people tell you no, 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 then maybe you need to go talk to somebody else if you believe in your heart that it can work. Yeah. It's just like when I told my mother that we were had this thing going yeah. and I was going to sell all my retail stores and she had a bad heart and she'd always would lay down and she sat up out of there, out off the uh, couch yeah. and looked at me and she said, you're on dope again, aren't you? I said, you know, I was never off of it, Mom. I yeah. said, but just believe me on this, you know. Yeah. And a couple years later before she died, we had started getting so much press. New York Times, you know, Cox News Group, which covers Atlanta, yeah. Detroit, L.A. I mean, we, we, you know, she was getting articles from all over the her friends all over the united states where i'm quoted in there That's funny, and, man. you know so she said i think you did right you know so that's awesome. she died thinking i did right that's you know? a that's a hell of yeah a oh yeah man that's awesome yeah where do you want to go next 10 years you talked about you know you you ha you're happy with the capacity that you have right now uh you know there's continues to be a lot of new festivals and blues interest here where do you see this in 10 years Provided that nobody listens to the show. Provided that I don't die. <laughs> that I don't die. No, they don't come and buy it for you. What, what did you, you say if they had a, the amount I think you said is a boatload? Um, Ten years from now, I, I mean, I, I see business has increased every year since we've had it. Okay. You know, so I just, I see it increasing because very seldom people all, I just checked in a couple from London that was here four years ago wow. you know it's still on their mind it's awesome man. four years later you know well i mean you're on my mind and and, and, and on your coat on, on, the on your jacket yeah man yeah so yeah this place uh -huh. is awesome man where uh where can people find you so it's shackupin.com that's it man type it in just right or you'll get a porn site wow the word shack up or trigger words for pornography i did not know that so if we ever you know if, so if it, if business ever declines you know what we got a hell of a porn site <laughs> you know so it's s h a c k u p i n n yes that's correct yeah do you guys do any social media at all there's instagram or facebook half i asked you know not yeah. not really not i mean we just when people leave here they talk about their experience here yeah and they're the ones that do the 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 face the facebook facetime all yeah. that face stuff you know sounds good well guy it's been an honor to have you on the show i really appreciate you taking the time to share your uh, your small business war stories with us and uh, best of luck to you man good seeing you again good see you brother maybe we'll see you again down the road sounds good i'm staying here tonight so cool thanks thank you for listening to small business war stories if you enjoy the show share it with a friend or you can subscribe on itunes stitcher or on our blog at blog.proven.com if you have an idea for us, we'd love to hear it. Please email us at podcast at proven.com. See you next time. Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes.